in this edition of Back in History, we present to you Ojuku's last speech before his departure from Biafra. Ojuku was the head of state of the now defunct Republic of Biafra. Biafra was the area that was made up of the then eastern region of Nigeria, the present day southeast and southwest. On May 29, 1967, Ojuku declared the whole of this area as the independent state of Biafra. Nigeria responded by declaring war against Biafra, and the war raged on for three years. More than three million lives were lost and properties worth billions of naira were destroyed. Biafra had no weapons to sustain the fight, and when it became clear that the Nigerian side was closing in on Biafra, Ojuku took the decision to leave Biafra as quickly as possible. Enugu, Biafra's first command headquarters, had long been captured. Umar here, the second command headquarters, had also been captured. Oweri, the last command enclave, was also crumbling into the hands of the Nigerian side. All was not well, and the fall of Biafra was just a matter of time, and the time was ticking really fast. Ojuku's initial decision was for him to leave Biafra quietly, without any announcement. But at a meeting held with stakeholders before his departure, Sir Louis Mbanefo, Chief Justice of Biafra, suggested to Ojuku that he should make a speech to the people to explain his absence. What to tell the people then became a problem, more so as Ojuku was not ready to announce his surrender at the time. It was then suggested that he should inform the people in his broadcast that he was going abroad for, quote, in search of peace. But in truth, Ujuku was leaving Biafra to take asylum in Ivory Coast and there was no plan for him to return to Biafra and continue with the fight. The insignia on Ujuku's official vehicle went thus, quote, to thyself be true. On this occasion, Ujuku was true to himself that the war was lost and that his dream of Biafra had become an impossibility. He then opted to flee in the last flight from Biafra. Here is the full text of the last speech broadcast on Radio Biafra on January 9, 1970. Quote, Proud and heroic Biafrans, fellow countrymen and women, once again I salute you. My government has been reviewing the progress of this war that has now raged for the last two and a half years with increasing fury. It is well that at each stage we remind ourselves of the purpose of this war, what we are fighting to safeguard, and why we are so determined to continue to defend ourselves. You have borne the brunt of the strengths of this war. You have suffered unmentionable privations at the hands of an enemy that had used every conceivable weapon particularly the weapon of starvation against an innocent people whose only crime is that they chose to live in peace and security according to their own beliefs and away from a country that had condemned and rejected them. Your heroism as a people has sustained our gallant armed forces in defending the territory of our fatherland and in giving you that protection that we all so ardently need and desire. You have had your villages and homes ravaged and plundered, your assets destroyed, millions of your sons and daughters murdered in cold blood, and your youth condemned to misery by the enemy's recent movements and indiscriminate shelling and bombing of hamlets, villages, and refugees in their camps and on the roads. All these sacrifice has been in the interest and with the sole purpose of achieving security, which was the main motive forcing our taking up arms to defend ourselves. We had proclaimed ourselves a republic, independent and sovereign, because we were and are satisfied that only through it will we guarantee our security. Nevertheless, we left the door open and declared on several occasions that we welcomed any initiative that offers us the security we need. Each time we had said so, our enemies and detractors 
have mischievously distorted our statements. We are entitled in the light of our recent experience to demand to know what measures are being proposed to our security. He went on to say, still in quote, the task of a leader of a people at war is to be responsive to the plight of his people to determine what level of sacrifice can be accepted. Your patriotism has exceeded all expectations and earned worldwide admiration for your fortitude. Armed with your mandate, I have striven to apply the forces at our disposal to the best of our ability against overwhelming odds. Throughout, we have made strenuous efforts for peace, taking initiatives of our own to get our adversaries to settle our conflict at the conference table. Each time a callous world has imposed a new set of conditions. Each condition that we fulfill gives rise to an entirely new one. More recently, some friends of both sides have made some proposals for an arrangement with Nigeria that in our view will offer to be our friends the security to which we aspire. This has been referred to as certain forms of union, confederal ties, association, or commonwealth arrangements with Nigeria. Ojuku continued, still in quote, once more to show her honesty and in accord with my frequent affirmations that I would personally go anywhere to secure peace and security for my people, I am now traveling out of Biafra to explore with our friends all these proposals further and fully and to be at hand to settle these issues to the best of our ability, always serving the interest of my people. Our detractors may see this move as a sign of collapse of our struggle or an escape from my responsibilities. If God helping me, we can, by this latest show of earnestness, secure for our people the end of destruction of our homes and property, I should be satisfied that this venture on which I embark with your blessing has yielded fruit. I know that your prayers go with me as I go in search of peace and that God willing, I shall soon be back among you. He then added, sealing quote, In my short absence, I have arranged for the chief of general staff, Major General Philip Fion, to administer the government with the rest of the cabinet to run the affairs of the republic while I go on this mission accompanied by my political adviser and chief secretary. I once more pay my tributes to the Biafran armed forces and urge all ranks to maintain their positions while I seek an early honorable end to this struggle and all the suffering it has brought on our people. Proud and courageous Biafrans, noble Biafrans, Biafra shall live. God bless you all. End of quotes. Ojuku then left Biafra at night in what became the last flight from Biafra. For the ordinary people of Biafra, Ojuku was indeed traveling abroad in search of peace and would soon come back to Biafra for their sake. But for the members of Ojuku's war cabinet and for Ojuku himself, the truth about the broadcast was that Ojuku had given up on the war and was in fact leaving Biafra with no intention to return. He was leaving to take asylum in Ivory Coast. Ojuku's departure was in fact the end of Ojuku's declaration of the independent state of Biafra. The broadcast was recorded on tape and announced intermittently on Radio Biafra. Ojuku flew out of Biafra with his wife, members of his cabinet and their children, together with all such persons that were lucky to make the flight. The flight, a cargo plane, took off from Uli A Strip at night. The plane did not have the conventional ladder for passengers to climb into. A makeshift ladder had to be used and the people moved in in serious panic, with some persons almost falling off the ladder. The plane had only four seats for passengers and the seats were occupied by Ojuku, his wife, his political advisor Dr. Michael Okbara, and the last seat was occupied by Mr. N. Yuakban, secretary to Biafra. 
in your aquan was from present day Aquaipum State. All other passengers either stood in the plane or sat on their luggage made up of rags and all manner of items which remained of them in the war torn Biafra. The passengers had to endure these for the five hours of the flight to Ivory Coast. It is reported also that as the plane was making its way out of Biafra, the plane was repeatedly shot at by the federal troops that were on ground in Biafra, but for the maneuvering of the highly experienced and courageous pilots that were in charge of the plane, the plane would have perhaps crashed to the ground. If the plane had crashed, scores of humans, including Ojuku, would have lost their lives. The last flight from Biafra was indeed a frightening flight, by all reasonable assessment. The passengers and crew had their hearts literally in their hands. They feared for the worst, but by divine providence, the plane safely zoomed out of the Biafra and Nigerian ace base and landed safely at a military base in Ivory Coast, and the passengers then began another phase of their lives, with a future so uncertain and bleak right in front of them. They were offered accommodation by the government of Hofet Boykney, who was the president of Ivory Coast at the time. The story of the Nigeria Biafra war is indeed a story that can be told in several volumes, and the story shall remain in the minds of the Igbo people of Nigeria, the minds of others, and in the history books of the world for many more years to come. Thanks for watching this edition of Back in History, and do remember to subscribe to this channel or follow the page for regular notification on every new video. I remain your friend and host, Ekemi Udim, wishing you the best of time as I encourage you to continue to accompany me on this historical journey for the documentation of the story of the African continent in contemporary digital forms.